I made my first feature film for around $15,000. And in this video, I'm gonna be going over the budget, how much money I've made four years after its initial release, and I'm gonna tell you what I would have done differently if I had made the film today. Making a no-budget feature is nothing short of a miracle for us wanting to get into independent filmmaking. It's always been a dream of mine to do so, so I decided to make the leap back in 2017. I break down how I made this feature in another video, which is linked somewhere here or in the description for you to watch later if you would like. For a quick TLDR, I grew up making a ton of short films and worked on other colleagues of mine's feature films and just whatever projects that I could get on. But in late 2016, I finished my first feature film script, Cashing Out, which I shot the following year between February and June of 2017. I absolutely had no idea what I was doing, hence why I started this YouTube channel so I could learn from my mistakes and you know, share those experiences with all of you. I thought it would be cool to look back at what I actually spent during the making of this film so you can actually have an idea of what expenses you can expect while making a movie. But before we get into that, I want to emphasize something important. I said at the beginning that I spent a little over $15,000 making this film, but I did not have all 15,000 of that, you know, right up front. Now I did live with my parents while I made the movie, so I didn't have a ton of living expenses, but I did have a job. It wasn't a full-time job. I was working, you know, I think the most they would let us work at that time was 30 or 32 hours. So I was working part-time at a movie theater, um, but I didn't take any time off. Like I was working and with a movie theater job, that's primarily the weekends, which is usually when people would shoot a, a film like this, but I had to work. So, you know, there were times when, you know, I would work nine to five and then sometimes I would have to go to work like six to two or three a.m. And then I would do that every weekend, every day of the weekend, as well as on the weekdays. So that was a little crazy. I was a lot more ambitious in my 20s than I am now. But you could see the lengths that I was willing to go to to make this film. I did have a little bit of money saved up, but I tried to keep the cost very low when I was, you know, making this thing and I just spent a little bit at a time. So it wasn't like, oh, I got $5,000 right now, so I need to spend $5,000. I didn't budget this film. I didn't go line by line trying to figure out what everything was gonna cost. It's just, you know, when I say the budget was 15,000, that's just what I spent. So just over the four years it took me from conception to release, I spent about $15,000. Now, like I said, this movie took about three months to shoot and I didn't have any major expenses during production, which obviously helped a lot. It's important that you guys know this because, you know, I know it can be really intimidating for somebody for, for me to say, like, I made my movie for $15,000 and most people are like, I don't have $15,000. Like, how am I supposed to do that? I didn't have $15,000. Like I said, that is, you know, broken up into four years essentially. So I just spent a little bit of it at a time as I had money. And that's something I need to remind myself of now. Cause I'm like, you know, trying to figure out how I can make a bigger film the next time I make a movie. And I just have to remember, I didn't spend all that money at once. I'm breaking this first part into two sections, which is going to be production and post-production. There's no real reason for that. Other than the fact that's, that's just how I kept track of everything. Back then, I'd probably break it down a little bit further for future movies, but that's essentially what I did here. So let's go ahead and actually start with the production expenses. Now, I want to say this isn't going to be 100% accurate. I want to say this is probably within like 95 to 98% accurate. I was pretty good at like spreadsheets and stuff like that. Like I'm a super big spreadsheet nerd, as you can see here, but you know, I don't even know what some of this stuff was just because it's been, you know, a little over seven years since I've made the film, like actually went into production and post-production. So I don't know exactly what all this was, but you know, we'll try to break things down as best we can. So you can see here, I got a spreadsheet and then I have things um, divided into different categories on what I spent. Um, so like we got costumes, we have craft services, which is just your catering or food, which, you know, I, I say catering, but that's me having my mom make all the food, bless her heart, you know, that she made all the, f you know, food for this movie aside from, uh, you know, a couple times that we had to order pizzas or something. Um, we have equipment, which I didn't spend a lot of equipment and something I want to note too. I had the camera before I shot the movie, so I didn't add that into the budget here. 
And I have a feeling a lot of you probably won't either. If you hire a DP, I would really recommend hiring a director of photography with a camera package if you do. So I was essentially hiring myself who had the camera package already. So I'm not going to count that in this, but I did shoot this on a black magic um, pocket cinema or not, not the pocket, but the black magic, like the original, I think it's actually in the corner over here. The, the camera I shot cashing out and is this one over here. And I want to say back when I bought it, I tried to buy things used. I don't remember if I bought this camera brand new, but brand new, I think it was like $2,000. So if we really want to stretch things, like let's just add $2,000 to the budget if we really have to for the camera lights and stuff like that. Again, I had been purchasing lights and stuff just throughout the years. So I'm not really counting that. It was just equipment that I was adding at one point or another. Like I have this big aperture Amaran light that's lighting me right now. If I'm gonna shoot a movie with that, I'm probably not gonna add that unless I just add it as a rental fee, you know, for, for myself. We have grip stuff, which I still don't know what the definition of what a grip does, but grip stuff. We have locations, I had to buy a couple locations. We have miscellaneous expenses. We have office expenses, which was just me printing scripts. We have props and we have travel. So what did I spend money on? So I had to spend uh, some money on, uh, for one of my actors. Um, he wears, you know, a costume, a work shirt is what I labeled it here. So that cost me $51 at Kohl's at one point. I bought ski masks on Amazon for 30 bucks. I got t-shirts for the, the pizzeria on Vistaprint for $70. I returned something at Walmart and I guess I added that into the budget. Definitely. Uh, let's see here. Food. I think I just gave my mom. I'm like, hey, let's make 500 bucks work for the entire shoot. And then I'll just get some other things when I need it. So like I got Domino's one time. I remember after um, the dancing scene. So I got coffee. So that's what Dunkin' Donuts is. I think I got some donuts too because I had a lot of extras and people who were doing me favors. So I just wanted to provide that for people. Um, I treated my cast and crew to steak and shake after that shoot too, as just kind of a thank you. Cause that was just a big scene that I really, really wanted to do. Um, that was kind of like my, my Hollywood moment, if you will. Like, I'm like, if there's going to be, I couldn't do a big like robbery scene. Well, we had the big robbery scene in the beginning, but I, I wanted to do something big with a lot of extras and all that, which I did at the movie theater too. But you know, that was a big, big scene for me. that was, that was the most costly scene in the entire movie. Um, we got some random cost at Walmart. I bought, looks like I bought my mic. I'm assuming this is what this is, 400 bucks. So that was probably the Rode NTG2 that I bought. So I think I bought that during cashing out. So I don't, I don't remember when I purchased everything, but that sounds about right for that mic. I think I already had my uh, recorder, the, the Zoom uh, H6 I bought. So I didn't count that in this budget. I think so. If we run across it, we'll, we'll talk about that, but camera stuff, cords, lights, lighter fluid. I don't know what I need a lighter fluid for, but you know, just, I don't know what I had to buy with lights that might've just been light bulbs or something. Uh, for the locations, I had to rent the venue for my dance scene. So that cost me, uh, I put a down payment down for, I think, no, I, it was, $350. And then I had to move the day, which cost another $250. So that kind of sucked because, you know, I, I didn't have a ton of money, but it is what it is. Um, then I have, okay. So a lot of my miscellaneous is, um, I bought, I had an after party once shooting was done. So I bought a bunch of pizzas again and bought a bunch of liquor for everybody. So that was fun. Um, copywriting cost me, looks like ScreenCraft off, offered that as a service which I think, you know, you can skip that, but I think I tried to keep it, um, you know, simple. And I tried to get a grant for this movie too, which I failed. So that's another miscellaneous expense. We got some hard drives, scripts for the office expense that was printing the scripts. So I got that done at UPS. Um, and then the rest of this is props. So we got the whiskey glasses. I bought at Goodwill for 62 cents. Um, I got uh, the time clock. I remember that time clock from, I don't, I don't remember what I did with that. I might still have it, but the time clock where they clock in, I had to go buy one of those. Got that from Amazon for 53 bar or eBay for $53. Prop money, $65 from eBay. And then we got random props. I didn't really know what these were. 
Um, let's see here. Prop beer. I think I just bought a bunch of beer and emptied it out and put water in it. Um, I did a return on Amazon, which I don't remember what that was. So, okay. It was the lights. <laughs> so I, here's another thing you can do too. If you really need to, you can return stuff if you have to. So like I bought lighting for the dance scene, like the color lights, and then I returned them. Cause I'm like, I'm never going to use these again. So why would I, why would I need these? And then we got other stuff. Like I made the poster for the dance scene. Let's see your other dance props. I don't know what these, oh, that was decorations, like uh, centerpieces for the tables, batteries, um, the urn, which wasn't a big urn, but that was the simplest one that I can get. I think it was actually a pet urn that cost me $40. And then travel. I tried to help people out with gas. So like nobody got paid for this film, but I, I tried to pay people who were there quite a bit. So like people came from Indianapolis. I live near Chicago. So that's about a two and a half hour drive. So I'm like, hey, this is, you know, we negotiated a price for gas. This is roughly what I paid for it. Sometimes I had to get a hotel room. Um, if crew came, uh, you know, more than a few days, I tried to help them out. Like most people who came one day, they just volunteered their time. But if people came for multiple days, I tried to help them out as best as I could. Um, and then I got some gifts from my actors. I don't remember exactly what I got them, but I spent 34 bucks on that. So that was pretty much my entire production budget, which we're going to go down here and we're going to look at what that actually cost. So for production... Pro costumes, I spent $130. Craft services, I spent about 1000 Equipment, I spent about 500 And again, I, th I think the most, the majority of that must have been my mic. So I didn't spend much aside from my mic. So I tried to use whatever I, I had. Grip, cords and stuff like that, I spent about $80. The location was $60. Miscellaneous, like the after party and all that and just random expenses was $800. Printing the scripts, $50. I spent about... $900 on props and then $1,300 for travel for my cast and crew. So all that together ran me about $5,300, $5,325.70 to be exact. And like I said, I don't know if this is, you know, how accurate this is. I'm going to say what's within, it, it's got to be at least 98 to 99% accurate. I may have missed a thing here or there. But, you know, like I, I spreadsheet everything because I wanted to track every single cost because I'm like, when I make another movie, I want to know exactly how much I spent on the first one. So let's go ahead and move down to what did I spend money on for post-production now? So when I talk about post-production, I'm talking about both editing the movie as well as um, releasing the movie, distributing. So like I made a ton of, you know, um, videos on Film Hub and Amazon no upfront cost there, fortunately, but there's some other things that I did have some upfront cost. So we'll, we'll go to these individually, but um, I'll go through my categories real quick. So we have advertising, we have apps, which is just things that I bought, you know, to like editing apps to enhance the movie, closed captions, contract labor, creating a DCP for th uh, theatrical exhibition. We have the DVDs and Blu-rays that I made, random fees, Film festivals, uh, legal, because I had a lawyer, uh, merch supplies, other, which I don't know exactly what some of these are, so that's going to be kind of useless. Um, shipping fees, because I incurred a lot of shipping fees from selling merch and the theatrical distribution. Taxes, travel, and website fees. So let's go over some of the things that I spent on you know, post-production. So most of my advertising were Facebook ads. So I took out a lot of Facebook ads when the movie came out. So I'll tell you exactly what I spent, but the majority of that was the Facebook ads. I also did a Comic-Con. So that was the fee to exhibit at Comic-Con, uh, Northwest Indiana Comic-Con. Had a booth there and I sold, you know, shirts and Blu-rays and all of that. Um, this fee from print keg was, I got this big poster that's behind me. I think I got three of those made. So for, I thought they were 50 bucks each. So maybe it'd been 50 altogether, not a hundred percent sure, but those were expensive to make. But the most of the, the majority of these were, were Facebook ads that I spent money on. 
So I had like a daily allowance or something and then I would adjust and blah, blah, blah. But you know, that that's pretty much all I spent on advertising. I guess websites would still technically be advertising too, but I didn't know that back then. So I just separated that just for ease. Uh, so apps, I spent $150 on digital anarchy for a Flickr plugin because I'm an idiot and I didn't understand the frequency of light bulbs or, or testing certain light bulbs. So I had a Flickr problem on cashing out, which, you know, if you have a, a good eye, you may still be able to see it's mostly in the garage scenes uh, with all the poker. Um, but I had to buy a Flickr plugin because I, I noticed the footage was flickering really bad with the lights. So I needed a solution for that. And luckily, this did it. So I, I got real lucky there. I spent $19 on Rampant. I don't remember what that was for, but it must have been something that I used. Uh, $16 on screenwriting services. I don't really know what that was, but I spent $16 on something with screenwriting services. I spent $200 on Artlist. So I didn't even buy Artlist until I needed it. So that's why it's only on there once, although it is you know a yearly fee. But you know I bought it when I needed it. I have ramp it on here twice. So was that a mistake? So did I spend less than I needed? I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, and soundly soundly is a, a sound effects service. So I, you know, I did all the sound design on the movie essentially. So I needed to get a place with sound effects and soundly made that super simple. So for, you know, to, to make things a little bit easier, that's where I got a lot of my sound effects. I also used freesounds.org as well as creating a lot of the sound effects but you know, stuff that I couldn't easily do, that's where I got it from. For closed captions, I spent $118. Now this is not accurate to today. Um, so that was back in 2019 when I created the closed captions. And I think they were like a dollar a minute. I think now they're like a dollar 50 or something. So keep that in mind. Um, I have the contract labor fees. So I had a colorist on the movie. I don't know what these Upwork fees are. I I really don't remember. I'm remembering I briefly hired a an accountant for some consulting on some things. So I was kind of confused on how to do some things. If if I were to change things now, I, I understand accounting a lot better than I did back then. But I, I'm assuming that's what that cost was. Um, then we have for the DCP, I have hard drives that I had to buy. Um, the DCP kits, which I think was a, no, the service right here, 50 bucks. I don't know what DCP kit is. That might've been to get the, the casing for the DCP as well as like, um, some other stuff. Don't remember a hundred percent sure, but you know, I spent 125 bucks on something with the DCP with the, let's see here. Oh, I also had the, so the DVD costs, so random DVD cost, I did some tests and then I ended up doing like a, a, a mass production of them. So I'm sure that some of these lower costs were just tests. And then once I got comfortable, that's when I started spending a little bit more. So we got the Blu-ray boxes. So I don't remember, I think I got all the Blu-ray boxes on Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. So you can buy just blank Amazon cases. And then I actually, you know, designed the Blu-ray case and the DVD case myself. So I was able to save there. But, you know, I had I had to get the the slips made for those. So it looks like, or no, maybe I did the cases. I'm not 100% sure because I got $76 here from Blank Media Printing and case and slips here too. So I may have gotten the cases. I may have bought a bunch of cases. I'm not 100% sure. But alas, I, you know, created the Blu-ray myself, like the, the authoring and all that. I did all that myself, but I had to get you know, stuff printed. I wanted to be real specific too. like here. Here's a, you know, they're not sponsored, but there's, if you want to do a Blu-ray, you know, they they don't do the authoring, but you know, if you need a really cheap place to, to print Blu-rays and DVDs, um, you could do it with uh, a service called Kunaki, which Kunaki, if you want to sponsor me, that'd be great. They probably won't, but, um, you know, they're a great service. They're super cheap. The reason I didn't do everything in Kunaki is because I wanted to do a Blu-ray and a DVD. I was really gung-ho on that for some reason because I just didn't believe a lot of people had Blu-rays. Um, next time I would probably just do one or the other because it's really cheap. So I'm actually, let's go to Kunaki really quick and check them out. It's been years since I've been on this website. I'm curious if they 
do, so they do, let's see here, prices. So for a Blu-ray, let's see here, DVD, one to 5,000, they charge 45 cents for, and I think they do, they do the cases too. I don't remember exact, but they were like, they were like a buck or something crazy. So Blu-ray disc with no cases, $1.55. Blu-ray disc with case, one color printing, one insert panel. So they're basically a manufacturer. This this is a manufacturing place. So like a Blu-ray you can get for $2.25. They'll seal wrap it and they'll do the same thing with a DVD. So yeah, DVDs are just 45 cents and then Blu-rays are $2.25. So you'll get you know the full Blu-ray with the case and the slip. You have to design all this stuff yourself, but they'll actually manufacture it for you and it only costs $2.20. Now, like I said, I wanted to do a Blu-ray and a DVD, so they uh, Kanaki doesn't do that, unfortunately. So I had to you know, do all that stuff manually and just get all the pieces. But I think next time what I would do is just do a Blu-ray and a DVD, like do them separately, um, you know, to try to save on some costs there. Um, but you know, that's, that's the way to do it. And you know, they're super cheap, I highly recommend them. Great quality. But like I said, you have to, I haven't been able to find an author for Blu-ray and DVD. And, uh, I, I did it with Adobe software. Like I had to hack some software and, you know, upload it onto my computer, you know, the, the Adobe Encore. And I haven't been able to find a Blu-ray authoring service since then. So if somebody knows how to do that or has a service for that, let me know because I'm going to need a hookup in the future at some point or a contact rather. I don't, I don't want people to work for free. But if I were to do Blu-rays and DVDs again, that's how I would do this essentially. For fees, I had, I think this is more, I think, um, for incorporating my LLC. So I counted my LLC fees in the cashing out budget because I created the LLC, you know, because I made the movie. Um, but these, those were some fees from the state of Indiana. Don't remember exactly, but just some random fees. And then I saw, I also had some credit card processing fees. So I paid a contractor through credit card. Um, I should have just did it through PayPal, but I don't, I don't think I had the money up front. So I was like, you know, maybe I can just find a hack to do this on a credit card. And I did, which was nice. Um, business fees. I think this was all LLC stuff. So here, ink file, I spent $346 to create my LLC. Then we got all the film festivals, which I did everything through film freeway. Um, this $99 fee was like their gold package. I think it was called. I'm not hundred percent sure. It's been a few years since I've been on the website, but you know, basically it was, it was their subscription service and they give you discounts on certain festivals and stuff like that, which was definitely worth it for me. Um, back when I did it, I don't know if it'd be worth it. Like I spent just skipping ahead. I spent about a thousand dollars on festivals. So that saved me a lot of money there. But if I was trying to keep the budget under like $500 for festivals or even less, I don't think it'd be worth it. But if you're spending more than $500 getting their subscription service, I don't know if this sub subscription costs the same, what it offers, all that. So, you know, take this information with a grain of salt, at least back when I was doing this in 2020, submitting to festivals, 2019, 2020, it was worth the cost. Then we had the legal fees. Um, I had a lawyer, a friend that's the lawyer, and they gave me a big discount. But basically, they went in and cleared all like the logos and just made sure like there wasn't anything that I could get hit with some legal trouble with. So they basically just cleared the movie is all they did. Um, and I'll, I'll go over what that cost was here later. We have all the merch supplies fees. So like um, I got posters made, I got shirts made, and most of this was print on demand. Um, and I got some posters made and stuff for some cast and crew. So that's likely where I did it. Um, but I used Printful for my print on demand for the shirts and stuff. I think they do posters now too, but the posters were a little expensive. Whereas like if I just did it on Vistaprint, the posters were like $3 each, you know, and I sold them for like five or 10, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, that just saved me quite a bit. What else we got here? We got shipping fees. So we got some of these other fees. I don't know what, like this AWS merge, that was probably a test purchase, but like some of this other stuff, I don't, I don't know what this is. Hard drives obviously are hard drives. 
Um, I, I probably had to buy a bunch of hard drives. I, I know I had to keep buying hard drives when I was making the film. Um, but I don't remember exactly what I bought or anything like that. And then we have the shipping fees. Um, you probably save on a lot of shipping fees, but you know, we're not, we're not talking about what I would do differently quite yet, but the shipping fees was shipping merch, um, shipping stuff to the actors. Um, I, I did all the Blu-ray shipping myself, um, shipping like the, the hard drives to the theaters for the theatrical distribution. So like, that's what the, the fees. So if I spent money on something, even if I made money on something, I, you know, factored that cost in too, cause it's, you know, what you're supposed to do when you're running a business. And then I have the website fees. I used Wix for my website. Uh, I used big cartel for a second for my store, but then I moved it to Weebly. I think I'm not hundred percent sure. I use square for my webs for, for my payment processing, but I used Weebly, I think for the website. Don't remember hundred percent sure, but you know, then wasn't a ton of cost there to get that set up. So for post-production, I spent about $550 on advertising, $500 on apps, about 120 on closed captions, about a thousand on freelancers. Cost me about $600 to create the DCP for the theater. Cost me about $500 to create the DVD, about $500 in random fees, about $900 for the film festivals. Uh, about $2,700 in legal fees, about $1,400 to create the merch, $500 on other fees, $500 on shipping, $105 on sales tax, I filed sales tax, $78 on travel, and about $350 on website fees for a grand total of about $10,243.85. So with that, uh, all together with the production cost, my final total was somewhere around uh, fifteen thousand six hundred dollars, give or take a few dollars. But that's roughly what it cost. So I, I've been rounding to uh, fifteen thousand dollars just for the sake of simplicity. Um, probably closer to sixteen thousand if I'm being honest. But fifteen thousand is a nicer number to market, obviously. But yeah, that's I mean that's a basic breakdown of, of all of my fees from everything from production to post-production. Um, now I mentioned throughout this video that there were some expenses I felt like I probably could have avoided with the knowledge that I have today. And I wanted to quickly give an example of where I would cut cost if I were to do this a little bit differently all right, so let's go ahead and go through the list. So I got everything copied here from up front. So actually I didn't even go through the percentages, but looks like my biggest percentage was the legal stuff and then merch. Although merch, it's really hard to count the merch when, you know, I pretty much only spend money on money that I, you know, made essentially, especially with the print on demand, like not exactly with the, the DVDs and the Blu-rays. Um, but I, I think I did make money there if I'm not mistaken. So we'll, we'll compare the you know, the, the fees and everything and see if it was worth it. But let's see what fees that I can cut out. So I got everything copied here. Now I'm going to leave relatively everything alone on production because there's not really much I can change here. Like costumes is going to be the same. Craft is going to be the same. Equipment, blah, blah, blah. So most of what I think I could have cut is going to be in the post-production section. So let's see what we can just automatically get rid of. So let's just say I didn't want to do any merch. Let's just say I just forgot about merch. Wanted to keep things as low as possible. We're not creating any merch. We're not creating physical posters. We're not creating t-shirts. We're not creating Blu-rays. We're not creating DVDs. So let's get rid of the merch. We're going to make that zero. And then we're going to make our DVD cost zero as well. Now let's say I didn't have any freelancers. I did all the coloring myself. Maybe I figured out the accounting stuff like I had mentioned. Let's go ahead and get rid of that as well. Make that zero. Um, let's say I didn't do theatrical. Let's say I didn't make a DCP. All right. And with not creating a DCP, we're probably able to save on shipping as well, especially with, um, you know, not having to ship out merch. So let's make shipping a hundred dollars. Cause you know, it's probably not going to be that much to ship a couple things. Like maybe I got some special DVDs made or something for the cast and crew. I don't know, but let's just make that a hundred bucks. 
Now let's see what else we got here. Film festivals, spend $900 on film festivals. I've been touting like, I don't think it's worth spending more than $500 on film festivals if you're a no budget filmmaker. So let's just put that down. You know, I say somewhere between 250 and 500. So let's just say 400 for the sake of argument. Now let's say, you know, you didn't have any legal costs. You didn't talk to a lawyer. You just, you know, just did everything guerrilla style and just put out your movie. Let's put that at zero. Fees, we can leave fees the same. Apps, we can leave the same. So let's see. Maybe you didn't even create a website. Maybe you, you know, just used Linktree for everything. That's fine. I'm going to leave the website the same. And you can do a free website too. Like you don't necessarily need to buy a domain and all that. So actually, let's let's take that out just because you can create. There's so many free resources right now. Like you don't have to spend money if you don't want to. And if you want to kind of hide the fact that you're using free websites, Bitly is free. So you can create like a Bitly link and just make that branded, I believe. I think you can make for free, not 100% sure there, but let's just say, you know, you just use, use a free link tree for your movie, link tree slash cashing out, which I probably should make that. But let's just say you use that because link tree is free and that's your, your website, you know, for, for, uh, for everything. So now let's go ahead and add these totals up because I don't think this is correct. So, that's going to be the same. And let's go ahead and add all this stuff together. So let's see where we're at. So now we went to post-production went down to 28, almost $2,900. And our grand total was about $8,200. So we almost cut the entire budget of this movie in half for things that I don't think I necessarily needed so much. And if I would have done that, I probably would have broke even on the movie at this point because I made about $10,000 at this point. Um, you know, that includes some merch sales and stuff too. So we'll have to compare that. You know, let, let's actually, let's dive into how much money we, we've made thus far. So I have all this stuff right here, you know, like uh, Film Hub, I got cash donations. I sold one Blu-ray on Amazon. Amazon's, uh, they once had like a print-on-demand DVD and Blu-ray thing. So I made $5 from that. Um, merch sales, Amazon Prime, um, screenings, the theatrical screenings, which we can talk a little bit about that too. And then Vimeo. So that's, we won't get into the individuals here, but let's focus on right here, the, the actual breakdown. So with Prime Video, I made $1,575.89. So that was through the Prime subscription when you were still able to distribute that yourself, as well as purchases and rentals. So that was about 15%. So grand total, we made $10,064.25. 15.7% of that was Amazon Prime sales. The merch uh, was, we made $2,753.25. Now that is with the Blu-rays as well. So let's actually add up the merch and the Blu-ray cost really quick. So we have DVDs, which cost four, about $470. Let's add that to the merch. So we spent $1870.61. Let's go back up here. So let's see how much we actually made merch. $1870.61 minus 2753. So we made roughly $800, $882.64 from merch and Blu-rays, which not too, not too shabby, you know, as far as like profit goes. So it was, it was obviously worth it. Like we didn't make, you know, a huge percentage or huge margin on that, but pretty decent, you know, all things considering. Uh, then we have the Amazon Blu-ray, which I, I guess I didn't count that with the merch sales, but that's fine. Um, we got $225 in donations. So I did like a sneak peek screening and I did some merch sales afterwards, which that's a great technique. If you are going to sell merch, make sure you're holding screenings or going to screenings and selling merch and Blu-rays whenever possible, because people are hyped up about your film. They're going to buy your stuff and want to support you, which was really, really nice. Uh, we made $5,400 from Film Hub, which was you know, more than half of what we made, uh, or half of the, yeah, half of what we made. Um, I made $15 from Hoosier Films, which is a distribution platform. Um, $23 and 15 cents from Other, which I don't know what 
other is, let me see if I can find that really quick. Other sales, I don't know where that came from, but we made $23.15 from it. $25, actually I'm gonna skip that one first, uh, Vimeo. So I, I have my own OTT platform, which I need to make a video about this because if you're looking to you know, have your own platform to be able to sell digital copies of your film, um, I highly recommend doing that. So I would like to, you know, make a video about how to do that because it's super simple to do. And in some cases it can be free for you to do. But uh, I made $8.50 from those sales. So it wasn't really worth it for me, but, you know, it, it's fine. Um, and then the screening. So I did have a theatrical release with my film. So I, I mentioned I worked for a movie theater and I struck a deal with them where they were willing to just show my movie for free and I would make anything from ticket sales. Now, I wanted to make ticket sales as easy as possible for people, and uh, I kind of regret that a little bit because I, I just did it. I had the theater do it, and then I would you know, just get a, a remittance state statement from them later, whereas I probably should have just done all the ticket sales, my stuff, my, myself, but that would have been a little complicated because I had a lot of screenings in a lot of different places. But if you are going to do uh, your own film screening, like rent out a theater and stuff like that, do the ticket sales yourself. Like it's... I, I understand you're going to want to make it easier and have people, um, you know, be able just to buy at like the box office. Like they just see your film and then they're able to go buy at the box office. I don't recommend doing that just because like I may, I technically made $1,900, 12 cents and eight, $1,912 and 88 cents. And because of the theater I went or did all this with went out of business, I only saw $25 and 59 cents of that. So I'm missing 1800, 87, 29. So I'm actually curious if we, if we added that back in, so let's add, let's add that money back in plus 1887.29. We would have made about $12,000 instead of the $10,000 that we made, which kind of sucks. Cause at this point I've made 65% of my, budget back. And if I would have gotten that money from the theatrical sales, I would have had 77% of my budget. So we would only have to make about $3,500 more, you know, to, to break even on everything. But that's just the way, way things are. So, you know, the screenings weren't really worth it in the end, but you know, if I would have, so going back down here with just everything, what it costs to create the DCP, I think that cost $600. So we would have made about $1,300 there, which would have been nice. Um, but kind of debatable, I guess if it was worth it, but you know, like let's do, I'm going to do a sample really quick. So I need to copy all these numbers really quick, but let's just see what we would have made compared to our fake budget if I would have, you know, not done some of the things that I did. Okay, so I got all this set up. Let's just pretend like we only did streaming. So for an example, um, we didn't do any merch, so all the merch sales would obviously be gone. So let's go ahead and take that out. Um, the Amazon Blu-ray technically would be, cause I didn't print that myself, but I'm gonna take that off just for simplicity's sake. Let's just say, let's just keep the donations the same and people just, gave me money afterwards for one thing or another. So the reason why they did donations too, I did a free screening. So I didn't charge tickets for like the, um, you know, the, the pre screening. So I did, I think in June of 2019 is when I did the first screening of cashing out. And then I released it worldwide, uh, the following January. So that was kind of like, you know, just the, the sneak peek, if you will, I wasn't quite ready for distribution then. And I think I was waiting on some film festivals and stuff like that. But so let's just keep donations the same. Film Hub, we're obviously leaving. Uh, Hoosier Films is a um, streaming platform. So we're going to leave that the same. I think other is physical stuff. So I'm going to get rid of that. The screenings, obviously, we wouldn't have made any money. And then Vimeo, we obviously would have. So we would have made 72.57, which is pretty dang close. Like I think, so looking back at our our mock budget here. I think it was 8179. So let's see how much money we would have had to how much money would have been left. So this is how much we made. And actually I'm doing this backwards. So let me go back down here. So here's our here's our total minus that. So I would only have to have made 
about a thousand dollars at this point instead of five fifty five hundred or whatever I have left to break even. So was uh, selling merch and Blu-rays worth it? It was worth it to me because like, you know, it made me feel like a real filmmaker, but you know, just looking at what I would do differently. And I'm going to get into here too about what I would have done differently at some point or what I would do differently if I were to do another movie. But you could see like, you can totally still make some money streaming if you keep your budget low. So like, you know, I only have a thousand dollars left before I would have broken even, yeah, you know, on my mock, you know, budget without doing all the, the theatrical stuff and, and all that. But, you know, it was cool. Like I wanted to have that memory for my first movie, my second movie. <laughs> I hate to relate this to, you know, like your second child or something like that, but you know, you don't, they're not as much work or you don't have to do as much or you just change things. So like my, my second film is going to be like my second child. I don't have any children right now, but if I had a second child, I assume it would, the experience is going to be a lot different but you know, just trying to cut some things and obviously it would have worked out here a lot better if I would have just kept the budget a lot smaller, but it's fine. I wanted to have that experience and I, I don't regret any of it. Like I'm not looking to make money with this movie. It was just like my exposure piece, like, you know, Hey world, this is what I can do. And I just wanted to learn how to create Blu-rays and you know, the, the streaming process and getting a lawyer and all that. Like it was just, I wanted it to be, it was a very expensive college. Um, so to recap, I bought a total, I brought in about a total of $10,000 compared to my $15,600 budget for a net loss of about $5,600, give or take. Um, I've kind of already broken down what I've done, what I've done differently with this film as far as taking things out. But I also had some thoughts I would what I would do differently just in general, if I were to make a new film. And this is kind of some of the things I'm, I'm talking about as I interview filmmakers and stuff like that. But, um, the number one thing I think would be to make a more marketable or write a more marketable script. So you don't have to do genre scripts forever, but I think it's a good technique at the beginning of your career. Uh, I'm personally looking at trying to make more horror scripts just because like they're fairly low budget to create and just really easy to market and distribute. Like you don't have to get like a, some name talent. Like you could just use any good actor that you can find as long as you have a, you know, no pun intended, but a killer idea for your horror script, like pretty easy to market and distribute those. And there's so many horror distributors out there. Like if you haven't seen my interview with Tim Wallach, we talk about this a lot. So I would definitely recommend checking that out, but there's definitely a lot more horror distributors out there. And, you know, a lot of them are niche, niche down to, you know, to different sub genres. So there's, there's definitely, you know, a, a way to distribute low budget horror films just very easily. But, you know, if you don't want to do horror, I would just focus on trying to do other genres like comedy and drama are really hard. So I'd really keep that in mind. Um, but you know, it's absolutely something you could do if you needed to, especially if you're taking the self-distribution route, I would also have a marketing plan in place sooner than later. There are plenty of ways to organically market with social media today, but I would have some plan in place beforehand. So you're not scrambling around later. And this is something I want to talk about in future videos and with filmmakers too. But, um, you know, it's probably going to be a while before I can do that. This next tip applies pretty much to the United States. Um, so you'll have to translate this differently depending on where you live, but I would either start an LLC for your film or minimally for your production company. Um, I have another video where you can watch where I'm talking about this more, but basically you can create an LLC for your film, like the individual film itself. So you can create like cashing out productions for an example as an LLC in your state. Um, and you want to do this in case somebody sues you. Um, now you want to do this because if they do see you, they can only go after the film and its assets and why it makes sense to do it. Like even down to the, the film itself is because then they'll be able to only go after the film itself and not like your other films. So for an example, like I created an LLC for myself and cashing out is just an entity under that. But, uh, you know, if I wanted to create cashing out LLC, then, uh, you know, if somebody sues me, they can only go over, go after cashing out LLC and not, you know, my production company too. Now, if you don't have a ton of money and, you know, honestly, like just managing all these LLCs is kind of a pain in the butt too. Like just creating one umbrella company, like what I got, you know, with, with my production company, totally fine. Like I don't plan on making LLCs for all of my films anytime soon. 
but you know, like, uh, an easy, another easy example to try to understand this, like in the United States, like rental properties are obviously huge with landlords and stuff like that. It's recommended that you create a, an LLC for each of your properties. So that way, you know, if somebody sues you, they don't come for all of your houses. They can only come for the one house. Same thing kind of applies here with your films. If you have an LLC for one of your films, um, they can't go after the other films that are under a different LLC. And another big point here, like you don't really want to avoid this too. Like not creating an LLC is kind of risky because if somebody does see you, then they could come after your personal assets. Like if you own a home or if you have savings, like just cash, um, if you have a 401k, an IRA, stuff like that, like people can come after you and sue you for that if you're not protected. So I would definitely recommend creating an LLC just for your production company minimally. This is also another United States tip, so you'll have to translate this as best as you can, but I recommend getting the script in the movie copyrighted. Um, I, I copyrighted the script, the movie, the posters, etc. It might be a little overkill, but it's better to be safe than sorry. I would say minimally at least do the script in the film, but um, yeah, I, like I said, better to be safe than sorry. Another United States tips, but I would get W-9 tax forms from all your actors and crew and pay them through methods like PayPal, Venmo, et cetera, because it reduces your workload later. Like, you know, Film Hub, for an example, pays through PayPal because they don't have to pay you a 1099 unless you make over like $20,000 or 20,000 transactions or something. I, I don't remember the law exactly, but, you know, if you're not paying your actors a lot, like if you're paying, like if you do have enough money to pay them, like hundred bucks a day or something like that. Just get a W9 from them and just pay them through like PayPal or Venmo just because that makes that process a little bit easier. Or if you do want to get a payroll service, you can use something like Gusto. Super simple to pay contractors. Like I, I use it for my day job. Very easy to use. You just have them fill out the 1099 electronically. They attach a bank account and then you can direct deposit them money. Um, this is a little more costly because Gusto has a monthly fee and you also pay, have to pay a monthly fee, fee uh, per contractor. But if you don't want to do PayPal or Venmo, that is another way that you can do that. I also recommend keeping cast and crew small, but do your best to hire great people as well. For an example, you may want to, if you're hiring a DP for your film, which I've never done and I would like to do in my next one, uh, I would recommend hiring one with a camera kit and a lighting kit, because that'll save you some rental costs on, you know, cameras, lights, power, etc. So, you know, that's, that's obviously something very easy to do. And a lot of, you know, DPs working on music videos and stuff like that, they tend to have their own kits, um, because they, they have to, in order to get jobs, freelancing jobs. So, hire somebody like that. And they're probably going to be, if they got a red camera and they're working consistently, they have their own kit, they're probably going to be pretty decent to work with. So just keep that in mind. I would do the same thing with like a sound recordist, make sure they have equipment, boom mics, um, you know, the gear, make sure they're able to lavalier mics, stuff like that. Definitely recommend doing that because again, if they are legit, um, you know, they're, they're going to be having that equipment and they're also going to be very good as well. Um, keep your script to just a few key actors if possible. Um, this will save you a lot of money if you plan to pay people, which obviously you should in some capacity. Um, but like I said, just keep everything as small as possible. Offer percentage points to your cast and crew if needed. I mean, you'll need paperwork to back this up and I'm going to, you know, try to make more videos about this in the future. Um, as far as like talking to filmmakers, as well as just doing my, my own research. I mean, it's something I've never done personally. It's something I, I definitely need to learn if I want to continue doing this and making a business out of it. Um, so I'll definitely share that with all of you. Keep your other expenses low, such as your craft services, the food you bring in, locations, props, etc. Use what you have. I mean, just try to keep that as low as humanly possible. Location, shoot, where you got, like if you're renting an apartment, like I got my house here, I could shoot at my house, I can shoot at my parents' house, I could probably shoot at the movie theater again if I needed to. I, you know, I got connections, you know, make connections with people. You know, your actors may know some place that you can shoot for a day or two. Like try to, you know, use what use the resources you can for free. You know, make food when you can. Like I, when I was 
doing cashing out, you know, I didn't really know how to cook, but now I know how to cook. So, you know, if I had to do craft services, like I know how to make large quantities of meals pretty easily now. So not a huge deal. Like I've hosted parties at my house with 40 or 50 people. So I sure I can handle craft service for, you know, a small cast of cast and crew of 10 people if I had to do that. So keep it, you know, keep it lean, keep it mean. You know what I mean? Same thing with props. Use what you have. Sometimes you'll have to buy something. Like for an example, like I bought a poker table. I, I don't think I went through this in the budget, but I had to buy a poker table. I bought some poker memorabilia. So like I said, some things you're not going to be able to avoid the cost, but use what you got. You know, set decorations, stuff like that. Try to keep it authentic. You know, it, well, if you're, you're shooting in places like your home and stuff like that, it should be authentic already a little bit. Um, but, you know, just keep costs low, go to Goodwill, go to Salvation Army, go to thrift stores. Like there's so many ways that you can keep costs low on stuff like that. Amazon is a good place to find cheap props. Um, like for an example, I was going to make a horror feature film and I needed a, li a license plate made. Got a license plate made, a fake one for like 50 bucks, I think. So not, not too shabby there. But again, these are some of the things that I wish I would have understand stood better when I was first starting out and, you know, the budget and just all the money I've made so far with it. I'm really excited to make another movie. Like I really want to make another movie. Like I feel like I'd be really good. I don't know about like directing another movie. Like I, I know some people, as far as my creative creativity goes, like not everybody enjoyed cashing out and I'm completely fine with that, which I need to make a mindset video at some point, but at least producing a movie, I feel like I'd be really freaking good at at this point. So I'm really excited to make another movie. I would love to do that at some point. I have a lot of people reaching out that want to collaborate and that's great. I don't know when I'm going to be able to do that because I'm so busy with work, but I am so amped up to make another movie because I, I just know like I could kill it. Like I know I could just be really good at it. I'm just getting more information as I'm interviewing filmmakers and stuff like that and just learning and just learning from my mistakes, learning from my day job. I mean, I got a lot of experience like working in YouTube, you know, that's helping me with my producing skills. Like I'm getting so much better being a producer, like just being in the field. So, you know, I, I'm rambling at this point. I'm, I'm really excited, but, um, you know, I just hope I can make another film at some point, but that's all I have for now. Uh, if you found this video helpful, feel free to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. My first feature film cashing out is linked in the description. I appreciate all the support I get from watching these videos, watching my film, and just everything from you guys. I appreciate you so much. Uh, if you want to check out some more details on topics I discussed, such as the LLC creation or other things I talked about in this video, I got some videos here that you can check out. Um, but thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.